If you would open up your Bibles to the Old Testament book of Jeremiah, it's where we're starting our lesson for this evening, although uh, unlike the lesson for this morning, we're not going to be spending most of our time in the Old Testament, we're just kind of starting here. The things we're going to be talking about uh, translate through uh, both Testaments, what we see going on back then, and also what we see going on today. But it's a, a statement that is made back here that kind of launches off everything we want to be talking about. Back in Jeremiah chapter 6, and starting there with verse 16, it says, Thus says the Lord, Stand by the roads and look, and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is, and walk in it, and find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk in it. I set a watchman over you, saying, Pay attention to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, We will not pay attention. Therefore hear, O nations, and know, O congregation, what will happen to them. Hear, O earth, behold, I am bringing disaster upon this people, the fruit of their devices, because they have not paid attention to my words, and as for my law, they have rejected it. And I don't know how much you have studied this passage before, but looking at what it says and knowing that it's uh, by the prophet Jeremiah, he's talking here about the nation of Judah. That's the time in which he lived. He's known as the weeping prophet, the last one before, of course, this kingdom was taken into captivity in Babylon. But you see what he's saying of stand by the roads, and depending on your translation, that might say roads or crossroads is what he's really getting at. Look at the crossroads. Ask for the ancient paths, the good way. Uh, a few years ago, Jared Jacobs was here and he held a gospel meeting. And if I'm remembering correctly, that's the title of their bulletin where he uh, where he attends is the ancient paths along those lines. You know, look at the crossroads. Look at what your options are and choose the good way. And he's saying two things here. He's saying, number one, you have a choice. And that's really what we're going to be talking about throughout our lesson this evening, is that idea of making choices, of the decisions that we make, what our options are, why we weigh those options, why we make the choices that we make. And it's also pointing out the fact that there is a right and a wrong choice. He says, as for the ancient past, where the good way is, well, obviously, if there's a good way, then that would mean something that is not that way is not the good way. Pretty simple logic, it's a pretty simple assumption to make. If there's a good way, then there's clearly a, an evil way. There's clearly a wrong way. And then where we stopped reading there at the end of verse 19, he mentions, they have not paid attention to my words, and as for my law, they have rejected it. That was their, their choice. You know, we look at the Israelites, as we're doing in our in our scripture reading as we're going through in our classes on Sunday and Wednesday looking at the time periods of, of Joshua and of the judges and so often we we look at them and we I don't know we get frustrated we get confused why would they ever do this we would think how could people who saw the Red Sea part who see all the miracles that God is performing how could they even contemplate not following after God but you know all of that is just proof that seeing a miracle doesn't guarantee Faithfulness. It doesn't guarantee that someone is going to be obedient and reverent towards God. But, you know, we, we look at what the Israelites did and really we're no different in our lives. The way that we have God's word right here, right in front of us, and we can see it and we know what it says. And so oftentimes we just disregard it. We either, as we read about tonight, we leave something undone that ought to be done, whether as we read, by mistake or intentionally, or we do something where God has clearly told us we're to have no part of. We go against God's word. We reject His words. We reject His law. And it grieves God that we would do that. It pains Him. It frustrates Him. It angers Him to no end. That we, His creation, His creatures, whom He loves so much, He loved us enough not just to make us, but to send His Son to die for us, that we would constantly, again and again, reject His law and go against His word. But even though it pains God that we do that, He's not going to stop us. He created us with free will. We are free moral agents. It's one of the things that is meant when it talks about us being made in the image of God. What, what does it mean that we're made in the image of God? It certainly doesn't mean that God looks like us physically. God doesn't have a, a physical form. He's not limited to that. We're made in the image of God in the sense that we are eternal. We have these bodies, but we are an eternal soul. 
So we have a spiritual existence, and that spiritual existence is eternal. It lives forever, as God is eternal. But beyond that, we're made in the image of God in that we can think and feel like Him. Not like the animals who run, who run entirely on instinct. We have our minds. We can reason. We can think. We can use that logic. And we have the free will to decide what we're going to do. Now, all of our choices and all of our actions are going to have consequences, but we still have the freedom to choose. And so that's what we're looking at tonight, of what is it that we choose in our lives. And one thing I want us to keep in mind as we go through this is I'm not talking about just one instance. You know, we're talking here about, you know, stand by the, the roads and look. It's not like you come upon a crossroads once in your life. There are an infinite number of times where you're going to come to a point and you're going to say, what should I do here? And you're going to have to decide what it is that you think is best. So this isn't just a one-time thing. You may be thinking that, that this lesson is one long invitation. I'm talking about someone obeying the gospel and coming to Christ. That's certainly a, a choice that we have to make. It's the most important decision, bar none, that anyone will ever make in their lifetime. So... I am including that, but it's not limited to that. It's all of our lives, each and every day, all the choices that we have to make is what is it that you are actively choosing? And I think we might talk a little bit about the idea of actively choosing something and then passively choosing to do something. But let's start off the fact, what do you choose? It should be that you are making an active choice in your life that I am going to follow after God. And again, many people with the sermon title of what we're talking about, about choosing the ancient past and the good way, you may be expecting me to go back to Joshua. And I'm bringing it up now, but we're not going to take the time to go back and read it because we're, really we read it not too long ago, and I think we're all well familiar with it. Joshua made that statement, Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We have to choose. He says, you know, choose who you're going to serve. But the bottom line is, you're going to serve somebody. There's no getting around that. You have the ability, you have the, the right to choose, but there's no getting around the fact you are going to serve someone. And Jesus makes the same point over in Matthew chapter 6. Well, let's start back in verse 19 at the beginning of the paragraph. He says, do not Lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? And he says, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And the direct point that Jesus is making there is, of course, talking about our wealth and our material possessions, where he says, don't lay up treasures on earth. Don't worry about that. Don't be obsessed over how much you have and how much more you can have. He says you need to be focusing on laying up treasures in heaven. But the statement he makes here in verse 24, no one can serve two masters. You're going to be either serving one or the other. You can't have it both ways. And this might be one of the, the biggest things that people try to do when it comes to God, when it comes to religion, is they try to have it both ways. They want to have that religion in their life. They want to believe that they have God in their life and the hope that comes from that. They want all of that, but they don't want to give up anything in order to get it. They want to straddle that fence. They want to have it all. But Jesus says here, it just doesn't work. You cannot serve two masters. Your attention is divided. Your devotion is going to be divided. And devotion that's divided isn't really devotion at all. He says it just doesn't work. It's like we have come to find out through our uh, current uh, technology and research now, we know there's no such thing as multitasking. The human brain can only ever do one thing at a time. What we call multitasking is us just very rapidly switching from one to the other. But you literally cannot do two things at once. It just doesn't happen. It doesn't work. And so in our lives, we need to choose to follow after God. Because we're going to serve someone. And it better be Him. 
And the scriptures give us every reason to serve God, to obey Him and to follow after His laws. And of course, they give us every reason not to reject Him. But, you know, we think about what it means to choose to follow after God. And like I said, this is not a one-time thing. I'm not just talking about the point where someone would say, you know, I, I realize that I'm in sin and I need to be baptized, I need to become a Christian. That's included in this, but it's more than just that one moment. Because that's not the only time where someone would ever need to show that they have faith in God and that they're willing to submit themselves to God. And the simple fact of the matter is, if you're going to live your life as a Christian, it might mean making some enemies. Now we know in this life, we really only have one enemy, and that's Satan. And the word Satan literally means enemy. That's what we call the devil, because he is our enemy. We're not to view other people as our enemies, we're to see them as people who need God, just like we do. And if someone's our brother or sister in Christ, we're not to view them as an enemy, they're our spiritual family. But there are going to be people in this life that in one way, shape, or form, or another, don't like us that much, don't like what we're saying, don't like what we're doing, and are going to let us know. And it might not be in a very nice way that they don't like what we're doing. And so in that sense, yeah, you might make some enemies. You look at what Paul says here in Galatians chapter 1. As he's just finished saying that they've abandoned the gospel that he taught them and they're turning to something else, he says in verse 8, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man? Or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. And the point that he's making here is so simple. And it's something that we all understand on, on one level or another. You ask anyone, they'll tell you, well, you can't please everybody. We know that. It's just the way the world works. We have different personalities and different ideas about things you can't please Everybody. And if we understand that basic concept when it applies to our fellow human beings, when it applies to our family or our co-workers or whomever this group might be, why can't we see that when it comes to God? If you want to be pleasing to God, you can't simultaneously be pleasing everyone around you. And the message of the gospel here is going to bother some people. It's going to, the polite way to say it, is step on some toes. That's what it does. The message is that God has a law that He has given to us. He has revealed Himself through His Son. He has revealed Himself through His Word. He's telling us what we need to do. And when we fail to do it, either by omission or by commission, then we become guilty of sin. The Bible is telling us that we're wrong. It's telling us that we're guilty. It's telling us that we need to repent. We don't like to be told that we're wrong. We don't like to be told that there are things in our lives that we need to change, that we need to get rid of. We pretty much reject that idea most of the time, like 99% of the time. And that's what the gospel is saying. So it's going to, however you want to phrase it, step on some toes. It's going to make some people angry. As we read in the scriptures, it cut them to the heart. And so that's why if we're trying to please God, then by its very nature, we're not going to be pleasing to man. And if we're trying to just please men, then we're probably not going to be pleasing to God. You just can't have it both ways. And so when we talk about this idea of making this active choice, that in my life I'm going to follow God, like I said, it's more than just that, that one time. It's more than just that moment where you would become a Christian. Each and every day, no matter where you are, home, work, on vacation, it doesn't matter. If you make the choice to follow God, then there are going to be people who don't like that. And it might make things a little bit harder for you in this life. I mentioned this morning as we were closing out the lesson and giving the invitation, it's not easy to be a Christian. You're going to face some, some hardships. You're going to face some difficulties. And we can say this with certainty because it's not just my opinion. It's not just uh, speculation or guesswork or an, an estimate made by a lot of smart people sitting around. We find it right from the Bible. Over in 2 Timothy chapter 3. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, 
there in verse 10, Paul says, You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, and at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You notice the word choice there. All who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. This isn't an if, this isn't a maybe. It will happen. It doesn't mean that we're going to face the same kind of persecution as Paul. That we're going to be beaten, thrown into prison, be shipwrecked. It doesn't mean that. There are lots of different ways where we can face persecution. There are lots of ways where being a faithful child of God and holding on to that faith and not being ashamed of the gospel is going to make our life difficult. And we don't know what kind of persecution we might be facing from one day to the next. There's just no way to predict that. Nobody knows the future. But the one thing you can bank on is, again, if you choose to follow God, and we can choose not to, but if you choose to do it, know what you're signing up for. It's so often why we talk to people before they make that decision. If they're considering being baptized and becoming a Christian, well, just know. First of all, this isn't just something to be done on impulse. This is a lifelong commitment that you're making and understand what this will mean for the rest of your life. Now, it's the best decision you could ever make. And again, we have every reason to do it. And it's worth it in the end. Well worth it in the end. But just know, when you choose to follow God, this is going to be part of it. These are going to be some of the consequences. That you're going to be serving somebody. And you need to be serving God because God's the only one who can save you in the end. But doing so, it's not going to be easy. And it's not going to happen all at once. People don't change overnight. It's a process. Just as much as it's a lifelong commitment to decide to be a Christian and stay a Christian, you don't <coughs> stay the same. We're to learn. We're to grow. And we might make mistakes along the way, but we're to learn from them as well. And that faith that we have is to grow stronger deeper rooted in God's Word. And if someone is exactly the same person as they were five or ten years ago, that's not a good thing. That's a sign there's a serious problem going on. But as much as we talk about you know, making the choice that we need to follow God, that we need to acknowledge that we're going to serve somebody and thus we want to serve Him, that we recognize this is His inspired Word, we're going to read it, understand it, we're going to obey it that we're fine with submitting ourselves to God because He's our Creator and we're the creation. Let's also talk about the opposite side of this in making the choice to reject it. That you make the choice in your life, and again, this isn't just a one-time thing. It's something that we do dozens, if not hundreds, if not thousands of times each and every day of choosing to, instead of following God, to follow the world. Because like we said, you're going to serve somebody. Maybe the, one of the worst things that's happened is people convincing themselves, deceiving themselves, that they're the ones in charge, that they're not serving anybody, that they're doing what they want to do. But of course, when we transgress God's word, when we leave him behind and we cut him out of our lives, we're not the ones in charge. We're serving Satan. We're serving his devices. We're playing right into his hand because it's exactly where he wants us to be. But one thing we might say about those who would choose to just go with the flow, go along with the crowd, do what is popular at the time, and going along with the world, is that we would see it as being easier, that it's the path of least resistance, if you would, that it's easier than taking a stand for what you know is right. But let's look here in Luke chapter 14. There's a passage here. Let's look about that, and then we'll, we'll consider the idea of how easy it is. As Jesus is speaking here, starting with verse 25, it says, Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my 
disciple. And while we understand, of course, that Jesus isn't speaking literally here, Jesus is never teaching us to actively hate someone else. That would contradict all the rest of his teachings. So we know he doesn't mean that, but still, there's a reason that he used the word hate. And hate's a pretty strong word. He's saying, if they would mean more to you than me, if they would come first, if they have that prior, priority in your life over me, he says, it's just not going to work. You cannot be my disciple. And he says, even his own life, your life can't mean more to you than serving him. And again, that's why he uses the phrase of, you know, does not bear his own cross. And those words maybe have lost some of their meaning to us because we think of the cross, of course, we think of Jesus. We think of Christianity. We think of the symbol that it has become. But when Jesus uttered these words back there in the first century and you mentioned a cross, you're talking about a form of execution. Not just any, you're talking about the worst way that a person could die. We really have no comparison to it because there's not a whole lot of public, sec public executions anymore like hangings or uh, electrocutions, things like that. But when he's talking about you need to bear your cross to follow me, that's not an easy thing to do, to bear a cross. Understand the full weight of that sentence that he says, this is what you need to do if you're going to be my disciple. And it's like we were talking about before. Know what you're getting into. Know what it is you're signing up for. There's a lot of people who have an interest in Jesus. There's a lot of people who are interested in religion, but not enough to make an investment into it. And that's what he's saying here. You have to be fully invested. You have to be wholehearted. And so in that sense, yes, absolutely. It's easier to just be a worldly person, to not care about the Bible, not care about God, not have any uh, way, shape, or form of religion in your life. It is easier to do that than it is to say, I believe that this is the inspired word of God. And I believe this is what we have to know and what we have to do in order to be in that right relationship with God. And I believe that Jesus came and he died and he's going to come back. And when he does, he's going to judge the world. Taking that stand for the truth, like we said, it's going to rub some people the wrong way. It's not always a popular message. And so it's easier to just let it go and just do without but even though we say that, you really stop and think about it. Are we really content to say, well, they have it easy. They just don't care about God in their lives. That's a very blunt, callous statement to make. And it's one that we're basing it off of relativity. That's looking at our lives and comparing it with someone else's, which is something we really should never do. It's never good to get caught up in us versus them kind of thinking. But it's also one that is assuming that they're just over there having the time of their lives. How do we know that? You know, we look at people out in the world who go out and they're consuming all kinds of drugs and living in such an immoral lifestyle and it's made to look good by commercials, by the media. Of course it is. Satan wants it to look good. Satan makes sin look appealing. That's his whole job. And he's good at what he does, unfortunately. But that doesn't mean that these people who are caught up in it, who are just consumed with sin and not giving one thought about God, at least, again, that's our presumption, is that they never think about God, doesn't mean that their lives are so much easier than someone who is trying to do right and someone who is trying to live in a godly way. Over in John chapter 3. In John chapter 3, starting with verse 19, it says, And this is the judgment, the light that has come into the world, uh, the light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. And you might look at that passage and say, well, that's just reiterating what we've been talking about. That when we take a stand for the truth and when we preach the gospel, some people don't like it. And they'll, they'll try to shut us up. They'll, they'll try to drown us out or whatever it is. And yes, Jesus is making that point that the light exposes the darkness and the people don't like what they do in the darkness to be exposed. 
But you notice the way he phrases it here. He says, everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light. One of the main arguments you see used against the idea of, uh, of atheists, especially militant atheists, is if you can get them to admit that they hate God, then they're defeating their own argument that he doesn't exist because how can you hate something that doesn't exist? Jesus is making the point here that those who do wicked things hate the light. Well, if they hate it, then they know what it is, at least a little bit. And they see what it's doing. They're not ignorant of it. It's not that those who do wicked things refuse to admit that the light exists. God designed us a certain way. Like we said, he made us in his image. And that means that he gives us free will. But another thing that he gives us is a conscience. Now, we know our conscience can be unreliable. Because if someone is raised a certain way to think that something is right, then their conscience is going to tell them that it's okay, even though it might not be. And we also understand our consciences can be seared. If we do something long enough, we grow tolerant of it. And even though we once felt it was wrong, we can grow cold. We can grow immune to that. But the simple fact of the matter is God gave each and every one of us a conscience for us to get that gut feeling of whether or not something is right or wrong. So before we get up on our high horse and assume that people who are just out in the world living a godless life, that they're living it up and they're enjoying every second of it, understand, they might understand that what they're doing is wrong. And it might occur to them that it's not right. It's not that they can't see the truth. Maybe they can. They just don't want to walk in it. Like Jesus says, they, they hate the light. So it's not to say that it is so much easier to choose to follow after the world. People who are outliving the world, it doesn't mean that they've never heard the gospel and that's the only reason they're doing this. They might struggle every day because when they were growing up, maybe they did get a little bit of religion here or there. And they might not like it, they might not agree with it, but they can't stop this nagging feeling that something's not right. God designed us that way. So it's not clear black and white that choosing to follow God is the hard path and choosing to follow the world is the easy path. Some people who are actively choosing to follow the world, they're signing up for a difficult life. But of course, we would then ask, well, then why do it? Because they have convinced themselves that they can't change. They've convinced themselves that it's easier than following God, which I guess it is by a little bit. But it still doesn't mean it's easy, just easy by comparison. Choosing to follow after what Satan is offering us, the easy way out, the quick way, a life where... Again, we convince ourselves that we're doing what we want to do, that we're the ones in charge. It's a choice that we make. It's a choice that a lot of people, sadly, actively make in their life. That they see what this world has to, has to offer, and that's what they want. And they convince themselves for a while that that's all that matters, is the, the here and now. Like Jesus was talking about laying up treasures on earth or in heaven. They say, well, you only live once, and this life is all we have. And, you know, they might actually believe that for a little while. But, you know, if you talk to anyone who has worked in areas like hospice, people get to the end of their life, they're not too concerned about how much money they have in the bank or anything like that. So even if they were able to fool themselves for a while that it was all that mattered, eventually they start thinking, you know, what comes next? And they start wondering. And then they really struggle with what have I been doing in my life? And is it too late? And can I change? And all the serious questions and consequences that come with that. But you know, let's, let's consider the rich young ruler for a second. This young man who's brought up in the different accounts. We'll look at Mark here as he comes up to Jesus. And it's a very interesting scenario. Because here he is, he's quite literally at the right place, at the right time, talking to the right person, and he's even asking the right questions. If you go back uh, earlier to verse 17, he asks Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I mean, that's a teaching opportunity handed to Jesus on a silver platter. 
You can't ask for anything better than that. And when Jesus tells him, well, you follow the laws and the prophets. And the man says, well, I've done that from my youth up. I followed this and this and this, and it's all sounding good. But you get to verse 21. It says, And Jesus, looking at him, loved him, and said to him, You lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Now, there's not a doubt in anyone's mind that the rich young ruler here made a choice. He was given a choice to do what Jesus said or to let it go in one ear out the other, to ignore it, to completely reject it. And we see the choice that he made. He went away. He said, that's something I'm just not willing to do. But look at how he went away. He went away sorrowful because he knew the truth. He was, by most accounts, a good person. And again, that's something else we get caught up in. We think that people who are actively choosing to follow the world must be just bad people and rotten to the core. It's not the case. He was asking the right questions, but here he is ultimately making the choice not to follow Jesus. And when he made that choice, he wasn't happy about it. He wasn't saying, well, now I can go and live however I want and not care about God. No. He went away, but he went away sorrowful. Because he saw the choices that he had, he didn't like them. But it didn't change the fact that he made a choice anyway. He could have, talked, he could have stayed. He could have spoken to Jesus. He could have done what Jesus told him to do. Gone and given to the poor. But he just, he wasn't willing. He wouldn't bring himself to it for whatever reason. And so he went away. And we don't know what became of him after that. We don't know if he ever rethought it. We don't know if he ever repented. But at this time, you see what he decided to do. He went away. It's a startling change from coming up and asking what you have to do to inherit eternal life. Are we really supposed to think that in the five-minute conversation they've had, if that, that he's completely forgotten about eternal life and wanting eternal life? No. And, you know, as we read this passage, it seems to me that it's very clear he understood that what Jesus was saying was right. Because we don't see him try to negotiate or give a rebuttal. He doesn't say, well, Lord, why would I have to go and sell all that I have? He doesn't do that. He hears what Jesus has to say. He accepts it as the truth. But yet he still goes away. We have that choice. We are given free will. We either choose to serve God, to follow Him and what He has to say, or we reject it. But before we close out the lesson, let's talk about one other thing. Is that as we think about all the choices that we'll make in this life, sometimes we come to a difficult decision in our lives with our, our family or our job, whatever it might be. We reach this crossroads and we're not sure what to do. And maybe we think the best course of action is to just not choose. To just, you know, sit it out and wait and then maybe, you know, something will come to us later. And we put it off, we procrastinate. It's pretty easy to do, right? Tomorrow's problems are tomorrow's problems. We'll worry about it then. But the thing we have to understand, spiritually speaking, is that choosing not to decide is a choice. When we say, well, I don't know, if I follow God, I'm going to lose some friends, I'm going to make people angry, but if I follow the world, then I know that I would be lost before God. It's, you lose either way in that line of thinking. So a lot of people would think the safest course of action is, I just, I can't make my mind up right now. I need more time. Whatever, whatever, whatever phrase springs to mind. But saying that, thinking that you cannot choose. That is making the choice. Over in John chapter 12. 
In John chapter 12, there in verse uh, 42 and 43, there's an instance here where as Jesus is speaking, and he's speaking to all the people, it says, Nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so that they would not be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Very clear example of people motivated by fear. They didn't want to be put out of the synagogue. They were afraid of the repercussions of what would happen if they confessed Jesus. So they don't. It doesn't say that they try to stone him. It doesn't say that they're plotting with the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees to put him to death. It doesn't say that they have any active ill will against him. So we look at that and it's not that they are rejecting him. It says that they believed in him. But they're trying to not make a choice because they're afraid. And again, a lot of the times that's our motivation. It's why we don't choose, because we're afraid. If we choose this, it's going to hurt us. If we choose this, what might happen? Sometimes we let that fear paralyze us. And again, over in Acts chapter 24, we see an instance of somewhat by fear, but also with the idea that there's going to be more time. And again, it's one of the things that we do to ourselves, one of the lies that Satan tells us, that we have all the, the time in the world, even though we know it's not true. <coughs> Brother Chuck mentioned in his prayer. But here in Acts chapter 24, as Paul is, is in prison, he's in custody, and it says, After some days Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who was Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. And as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment, Felix was alarmed and said, Go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. At the same time, he hoped that money would be given him by Paul, so he sent for him often and conversed with him. When two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus, and desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. We look at this passage and we say, well, he was scared of what Paul was talking about. Righteousness, self-control, and the judgment. That's a sobering thought. But you see what he does. He just says, well, go away for now. He doesn't yell at Paul. He's not rude. He doesn't call him names. He doesn't call him a liar. He doesn't outright reject it. He just says, go away for now. I'll summon you later. And he's really not even saying that to just say it, to use it as a, as a stalling tactic, we see he's a man of his word. He does summon him later. For two years, they have a regular conversation going on. But after two years of seeing Paul, knowing the type of man he was, and knowing exactly what he was talking about, there's no way that Paul would talk to a man for two years, and after those two years, the man still would be ignorant of what the gospel was. He knows exactly what the truth is. But he doesn't make a choice. But in not making a choice, you understand, he made a choice. He wanted to keep talking to Paul. He was interested. And he never, never outright rejected it. Never called Paul a heretic. Didn't do any of that. But all his hearing must not have been a whole lot of listening. Or if it was... He didn't care. No good came from it. And in the end, he just left Paul in prison, left him exactly where he was in the first place. And so in our lives, maybe it's because we're afraid. We're at that crossroads, and we don't know what to choose. And so we panic and we just shut down. And maybe it's because we think, if we had more time to think about it, then we would arrive to a conclusion, but maybe we're not gonna get that much more time. And for the time being, when we say, well, I just can't choose for now, when you choose not to do what God is telling you, when you're saying, well, maybe later, or I might get around to it at the present, what is it that you're deciding to do with your life? One other thing that we might do when it comes to this idea of not making a choice is that maybe when, when we're struggling with something, again, we're at this this crossroads and we just don't know what to do. We just want to hand it over to someone else. 
That way we don't, uh, we don't take the blame. We don't look bad. We don't have to feel bad about it. If things go south, we just don't have to worry about it. Let someone else worry about it. It's off our plate. It's not our problem anymore. It's one of the things that we might try to convince ourselves of. Over in Matthew chapter 27, look first there at verse 15. It says, Now at the feast the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. So Pilate knew they had no good reason. Jesus hadn't done anything wrong. It was trumped up charges. He knew it. But instead of doing the right thing and releasing him, he asked them, who do you want? He didn't want that role, even though he's the governor. He is the one in charge. He doesn't, he doesn't want to make this decision. And then you look down in verse 24. It says, So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. He made this symbolic washing of his hands. But does it mean that Pilate is not to blame? No. He had every power, every authority. He could have let Jesus go at any time. But he didn't. Again, we don't see him joining in. We don't see him chanting crucify him. We don't see Pilate gleefully giving the order, wanting to hurt Jesus, wanting to put him to death. He doesn't do that. He doesn't outright reject him. But by not making a choice, by trying to leave it up to others, he had made his choice. He had decided what was going to happen here. He was going to let the will of the crowd go, even though he knew they were wrong. Even though he knew that Jesus was an innocent man. He chose not to choose. And when you don't choose Jesus, the simple fact of the matter is you reject him. There is no gray area when it comes to this. It is black or white. You are either with him or you are against him. As he said, no man can serve two masters. And like we've been saying, we're going to serve somebody. There is no option C. There is no door number three. You either choose God and serve him, learn his word, obey his word, and follow after Jesus and his perfect example. Or, like we said, you play right into the devil's hands. That he has you exactly where he wants you and you are serving him. You are serving sin. And we know what the outcome of that is going to be. And like we said, it's a difficult thing. Because it's each and every day choosing to follow God's work. In every decision we make, is this going to be pleasing to God? Like we talked about this morning. All you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. What does He want us to do? What is He telling us that we can do? <coughs> Are we going against that? Are we actively choosing to follow after the world? Or are we just passively choosing it because we choose not to care about God? Not to listen to what His Word has to say because it's too restricted. We interpret it as just being too difficult. But God doesn't ask anything of us that's too hard for us to do. And He doesn't ask anything of us that isn't good for us. He doesn't give any arbitrary commandments. Everything that God is telling us is for our own good. We might not see it at the time. We might not agree. But God knows what we need way more than we do. There are a lot of things in this life that we think we need that we really don't. We need to love God. We need to serve Him. Because if we do, if we are faithful servants of His, look at what He has promised. Forgiveness. Eternal life. 
A home in heaven where there is no pain, no suffering, no sin. And if we choose not to serve Him, either actively or passively, we choose to reject Him. Not only look at what we're giving up, heaven, paradise, but look at what the Scriptures tell us we have to look forward to. Hearing, I never knew you, depart from me. Hell is described as outer darkness, weeping, gnashing of teeth, where the fire isn't quenched, where the worm doesn't die. We don't want that. God doesn't want that for us. But He lets us choose. He's given us free will and He's not going to take it away. So tonight, if you are at that crossroads in your life, if you understand that in your life you are not in the right relationship with God, that you are guilty of sin, repent of that. Choose to turn away from it, that you don't want to live that way anymore. Repent of your sin. Confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Make that good confession of faith. And be baptized, immersed in water, so that you can rise to walk in newness of life. You can make that change. You can become a child of God tonight. While we still have time, because we're not promised tomorrow. <coughs> or if you are a Christian, if you have made that decision so long ago, what about the decisions you're making now? The decisions you've made today? What about the choices you're going to make tomorrow? Have you been choosing to be faithful to God? Or have you been trying to have it both ways? Because we know it's not going to work. If there is sin in your life, repent of that. Go to God in prayer. Ask Him to forgive you. We'll pray with you. We'll pray for you. If there's something that you're struggling with, let us know. Let us help you. If there's something that is preventing you from serving God as best you can, do something about it tonight. Before it's too late, have a seat on the front while we stand and while we sing.